Welcome everyone. I'm Chelsea Lake and I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore and I'd like to welcome you to PMB Live. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format in the midst of these extraordinary times throughout all of which we strive to bring you the authors you love and their books to our Politics and Prose community. At any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase Thaddeus Stevens, Civil War Revolutionary Fighter for Racial Justice on the Politics and Prose website. Additionally, you can ask our author a question by clicking on Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. While we'll try to get to everyone's questions, we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. Finally, we wanna thank you for being here with us today. We're so grateful to our family of loyal customers, keeping our business and our spirits afloat. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's author. Bruce Levine is the best-selling author of four books on the Civil War era, including The Fall of the House of Dixie and Confederate Emancipation, which received the Peter, Peter Seaborg Award for Civil War Scholarship and was named one of the top 10 works of nonfiction of its year by the Washington Post. He is a professor emeritus of history at the University of Illinois. Please join me in welcoming Bruce Levine to BNB Live. Thank you, Chelsea. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending. So I'll give you thanks in my own name. In the summer of 1863, the third year of the Civil War, Confederate General Robert E. Lee launched a raid into Pennsylvania, the raid that culminated in the epic Battle of Gettysburg. During that raid, one of Lee's division commanders, General Jubal A. Early, looted and demolished the Caledonia Ironworks, which were located outside of Gettysburg. The man who owned those ironworks was the attack's personal target, a Republican congressman named Thaddeus Stevens. General Early said he regretted only that he hadn't encountered Stevens himself on the premises, because if he had, the general swore, he would have moved then and there to hang him, and in his words, divide his bones and send them to the several states as curiosities. Jubal Early declared that he had destroyed the ironworks to make an example of Stevens, because he said Thaddeus Stevens had inflicted more harm on the Confederacy than had any other man in the United States Congress. Frederick Douglass, the former slave and abolitionist leader, agreed with Jubal Early about almost nothing. But he did second the general's appraisal of Thaddeus Stevens' importance. There was in him, Douglas said of Stevens, there was in him the power of conviction, the power of will, the power of knowledge, and the power of conscious ability, qualities that at last made him more potent in Congress and in the country than even the president and the cabinet combined, said Douglas. I began this prog project, I began looking more closely into Stevens with two questions in mind. First, what role did this remarkable individual play in the unfolding of the Civil War era, in the unfolding of the destruction of slavery, in the unfolding of what I regard as, and I'm not alone in this, the second American revolution. So that was the first question. What role did Stevens play? The second question is, why and how did someone become Thaddeus Stevens? Why and how did someone become so important a figure? And eventually, I recognized that answering both of those questions required understanding the relationship between individuals in general and their environment, between individuals 
and their specific historical setting. At the heart of Stephen's own individual story is the interaction between early influences that shaped his values on the one hand and the way he responded in later life to the escalating national conflict over slavery on the other. Those early influences helped to determine those later responses, but those later responses also modified who he was as an individual. So there is this interaction between the individual and circumstance. To, get, to grasp how he influenced the national conflict over slavery in turn requires recognizing that as a political figure, Thaddeus Stevens gave voice to the inner logic of that conflict. Understanding his role required recognizing how he understood and translated into clear words and bold conduct what Frederick Douglass called at the time, the inexorable logic of events. And it was by giving voice to that logic, the logic of what it would take to defeat the slaveholders rebellion, that Stevens was able to point the way forward for his party and for his country. I have thought Thaddeus Stevens was one of the most interesting, influential, and colorful figures in US history since I was in college. Stevens became a full-fledged, active, ardent abolitionist decades before the Civil War, during the 1830s, at a moment when only a tiny and a widely despised handful of white people in this country espoused that creed. At that early date, he stood not only for the prompt abolition of slavery, but also for equal rights for African Americans, including the right to vote. In the 1830s, therefore, he opposed the creation of a new state constitution in Pennsylvania, where he lived by then, because that constitution denied the vote to black men. During the 1840s, his home evidently became a station in the Underground Railroad. And soon afterward, he defiantly opposed the famous Compromise of 1850, worked out in Congress. Now, Abraham Lincoln, who was by then a former congressman from Illinois himself, defended the Compromise of 1850 for the sake of saving the Union from possible rupture at that time. But Congressman Thaddeus Stevens denounced the Compromise of 1850 because it allowed slavery to spread into new land and because it made it easier for slaveholders to recapture African Americans who had managed to escape from slavery into the North. And the year after that, 1851, Stevens served as a defense attorney in a highly publicized case about escaped Maryland slaves, fugitives who, when they were discovered in Pennsylvania, resisted recapture and did so with arms in hand and killed the man who claimed to own them. In 1854, the anti-slavery Republican Party was born. It was pledged, first of all, to prevent slavery's spread into all existing and any possible future federal territories. That is, Stevens soon joined and helped to build that party, and that party sent him back to Congress in 1858. And there, he managed to become both a central leader of his party as a whole and a fiery spokesman for the party's more radical wing. And when the Civil War began in 1861, Thaddeus Stevens sharply disagreed with the way that President Abraham Lincoln at first proposed to fight it. Now, although he hated slavery, and he certainly did, 
Lincoln did not initially look upon the war itself as a way to achieve slavery's destruction. He sought instead simply to put the Union back together again and to do that as quickly as possible in order to return to the work that his party had set for itself of peacefully, gradually, and eventually achieving the end of slavery. And doing that, Lincoln at first believed, required interfering with slavery during the war as little as possible in order to avoid exacerbating North-South hostilities any more than was inevitable already. Thaddeus Stevens considered that strategy deeply wrongheaded. He saw the war as an opportunity to do away with slavery swiftly and thoroughly. And he believed that Union victory in the war would require supplementing the purely military struggle with a frontal attack against slavery because slavery was the mainstay both of Southern society in peacetime but also of the South's war effort. So in Stevens' eyes, these two struggles were inseparable. The first, the struggle against the Confederacy, could not be won without waging the second, the struggle against slavery. Secession could not be defeated without destroying slavery. In pressing for his radical war strategy, Stevens was therefore among the first to champion confiscating the slaves owned by rebels, to demand full freedom for slaves who were confiscated, to demand bringing African-American men into the unions until then lily white armies, to call for widening the scope of emancipation, to include all slaves within the rebellious states, no matter who owned them. And he was among the first then to press for outlawing slavery throughout the United States as a whole, North and South. That is to press for an abolitionist constitutional amendment. And he did that by the way, a full year before Abraham Lincoln endorsed that idea. As Stevens came to recognize, taking these steps would mean a radical transformation, a social and political revolution in Southern society and the political revolution in US society as a whole. He fully embraced that transformation. He repeatedly said, as he did on one occasion, quote, we must treat this war as a radical revolution and revolutionize Southern institutions, Southern habits, Southern manners. The foundations of their institutions must be broken up and relaid or all our blood and treasure will have been spent in vain." End quote. Well, eventually Lincoln and the Republican party did adopt most of these measures. Stevens' efforts were instrumental in bringing that about because Stevens' words helped to reshape public opinion. Newspapers across the country regularly published his speeches. And many of those speeches were then reprinted as pamphlets, sometimes issued in hundreds of thousands of copies. Stevens' mailbox made clear that those speeches were having an effect. And changes in public opinion taking place in this way induced others or permitted others, Abraham Lincoln included, to move eventually in Stevens' direction. Stevens thus told the journalist late in life that, quote, some of the papers call me the leader of the House of Representatives. And he added, I lead them, yes, but they never follow me or do as I want them until public opinion has sided with me." End quote. Stevens' fellow Pennsylvania Republican, Alexander McClure, was thus convinced 
that, quote, had Stevens not declared for the abolition of slavery, as soon as the war began, and pressed it in and out of season, Lincoln could not have issued his Emancipation Proclamation as early as he did. In 1864, the wartime Republican Party tried to broaden its electoral base by attracting pro-war Democrats to its banner. And to that end, it nominated Tennessee Senator and himself a former slaveholder, Andrew Johnson for vice president. Thaddeus Stevens hated the idea and objected to it, but in vain. And when Lincoln's assassination in 1865 elevated Andrew Johnson to the presidency, that accidental president began to help the old Southern elite regain political power after the war and help them to try to force the former slaves down into a new form of subordination. At that point, Stevens vigorously pushed Congress to impeach Johnson and remove him from office, an effort that came within reach of success. In making the case for removing Johnson, Stevens argued for an understanding of impeachment that is in fact very relevant to our own time. Many if not most members of his party held to a narrow interpretation of impeachment, according to which a president could be removed from office only for breaking some specific law. But Stevens upheld a broader interpretation. He insisted that a president could be discharged for abusing or failing conscientiously to carry out the duties of office, whether or not that involved breaking a law. In his words, in order to sustain impeachment under our constitution, I do not hold that it is necessary to prove a crime as an indictable offense. Impeachment is a purely political proceeding. It is intended, he said, as a remedy for improper conduct in office and to prevent the continuance of improper conduct. So if an officer of the government abuses his trust or attempts to pervert it to improper purposes, he becomes subject to impeachment and removal from office. Well, this view, which was, I believe, consistent with what the Constitution's framers had in mind, remains very relevant, as I imagine you can see, if still controversial today. Although he failed to remove Johnson, Stevens nonetheless continued the struggle and became a prime mover behind the passage of the 14th Amendment, which uh, provided for equal treatment before the law and birthright citizenship, and called for a 15th Amendment as well to give voting rights, to guarantee voting rights to African-American men before he died. So, second question, how does someone become a person like Thaddeus Stevens? And that, as I said, is one of the main things I set out to learn when I began work on this book. I discovered that a combination of influences crucially shaped Stevens in his early years. Those influences included political traditions in the state where he was born and grew up, not Pennsylvania, but Vermont. Included as well his family's Baptist religious beliefs and included the content of his formal secondary education and then college education. Although previous biographers of Stevens have paid very little attention to those subjects, I found that they did much to explain Stevens' future conduct, did much to mold 
the man of the future. Stevens began life in a poor farm family in Vermont in the aftermath there of major social and political struggles, struggles by small farmers for rights to the land, right to own that land free and clear, and struggles by those same people for a democratic form of government. His family immersed young Thaddeus Stevens in the Baptist faith, which prized individual conscience and personal choice and mutual assistance among members of the community and prized as well at least a rough degree of economic equality in that community. His schooling then exposed him to the Greek and Roman classics and to faculty members and books that were steeped in the enlightenment and its emphasis on the power of human reason and support for what was then called a free labor system, which today we know as capitalism. Now, some of these influences contradicted one another, conflicted one another to some degree. So over the course of his life, as he grappled with the challenges that arose before him and the events that occurred around him, Stevens would have to iron out those inconsistencies, would have to resolve those contradictions. And what emerged from that process was a determination, in his words, to free his country's institutions from every vestige of human oppression, of inequality of rights, of the degradation of the poor and the superior caste of the rich. A colleague later said of Stevens that, quote, nature had given Mr. Stevens a generous heart as a result of which he seemed to feel that every wrong inflicted upon the human race was a blow struck at himself, end quote. Well, the wrongs that so deeply pained him, Stevens himself traced to the denial of democratic rights, to the absence of a fuller, more meaningful form of equality than the one that prevailed. That general outlook drove Stevens' hostility to and struggle to abolish slavery. Stephen's plan for reconstructing the South did not stop at legal and political change. The region's economic and political structure, he felt, must be transformed too. Central to such renovation was seizure of the rebel planters landed property and the distribution of that property among the former slaves themselves in the form of small farms. That, he said, would create a more egalitarian society. It would also give black voters the economic independence as farmers that they would need in order to resist political intimidation by white employers. Let them have their own farms they can have economic independence thereby and therefore not be made to do the work politically that employers might compel them to do or demand that they do. Now, Stevens did not originate this idea of the dividing the plantations among the slaves. The African-Americans did this themselves. Slaves and free people fought for land even in the midst of the war. They began working the soil owned by rebels who fled before Union armies. Stevens strongly supported those efforts and he sought to expand and consecrate them in law. He said, it is impossible that any practical equality of rights can exist where a few thousand men monopolize the whole landed 
property. Because how can Republican institutions, Republican with a small r, how can Republican institutions, free public schools, free churches, free social intercourse, exist in a mingled community of nabobs and serfs, end quote. Creating and safeguarding those Republican institutions, he said, required seizing and redistributing the property of the elite. Now, when still a young man just out of college and still heavily influenced by the books that had been assigned to him there, Betty Stevens had accepted differences in wealth in the population as inevitable byproducts of economic development and had little to say in criticism of such inequality. But now the revolutionary transformation that he sought to accomplish in the country compelled Stevens to see in extreme economic inequality, a severe threat to democracy. As a party floor leader, whose proposals had often proved essential throughout the war, one after another, one after another proposal that he advocated, which initially aroused little support, eventually proved itself to be necessary to union victory. And that gave Stevens great authority among his Republican colleagues in Congress. But on this subject, on the subject of the seizure and redistribution of the land, very few of his colleagues were willing to follow him. And so it was that just one day after Stevens introduced his bill, the House overwhelmingly rejected it. And more than two thirds of the Republicans who voted in the House joined the Democrats in opposing that bill and another 10 Republicans abstained. Well, why? Why did congressional Republicans reject these land reform proposals? Because it became clear, they rejected the idea of infringing upon the private property rights of landowners. The challenge of treason and armed rebellion against the United States had reconciled these Northern politicians to the abolition of a kind of property that they already considered sinful and illegitimate, that is human property. But most of them wanted nothing to do with infringing, especially in peacetime, upon claims to another kind of property, property and land that remained as close to their hearts as ever. And Republicans also wondered and wondered nervously just where, if they began redistributing landed property to people because they had been exploited and were now impoverished, where will that road lead them? The Republican New York Times of the day warned Congress, quote, if Congress is to take cognizance of the claims of labor against capital, there can be no decent pretense for confining the task to, to the slave labor of the South. It is a question of the fundamental relation of industry to capital in general. And sooner or later, if begun at the South, it will find its way into the cities of the North. A Boston newspaper worried in along the same lines that opposing the existence of landed aristocracies is too edged since it said, there are socialists who hold that any aristocracy is anathema, including the North's own economic elite. So if we signal 
that it is time to divest, to divest the Southern aristocracy of its wealth. Tomorrow we will be told that the same must be done to us. And so Thaddeus Stevens land reform proposals went nowhere. Stevens became terminally ill during 1868 at age 76, a moment when the hard won achievements of the second American revolution were already under threat, under threat from a resurgent wave of white supremacists in the South, as well as under threat because of the rise of political conservatism in the North and even within his own Republican party. So in a dark mood one day, Thaddeus Stevens told the journalist that his principal regret is that I have lived so long and so uselessly. But others held Thaddeus Stevens' accomplishments in higher regard. Two African-American ministers came to his sickbed, prayed with him, prayed for him, and assured him that the rest of the country's black population was doing the same. And when Stevens died that August, a racially integrated core of pallbearers carried his body into the Capitol Rotunda there to lay in state, flanked by an honor guard of black Union soldiers. Some 20,000 mourners, black and white, attended Stevens' funeral in Pennsylvania. And post-war conventions of free people praised him as, quote, a beacon light of our race, end quote. Frederick Douglass hung a portrait of Stevens on his wall. And a fellow radical Republican observed approvingly that Stevens had, quote, brought the spirit of John Brown into the work of the statesman, end quote. Then he Stevens wrote his own epitaph. And that epitaph was chiseled onto the face of his monument in a racially integrated cemetery in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And there it stands to this day. The epitaph that he wrote said this, I repose in this quiet and secluded spot, not from any natural preference for solitude, but finding other cemeteries limited as to race by their charter rules I have chosen this, that I might illustrate in my death the principles which I advocated through a long life, equality of man before his creator. I think this is a good time to remember Thaddeus Stevens, to remember his world and to remember what he helped to accomplish in it. So many of the issues that were central to that story are back in the news today. Numerous state and local governments are targeting the voting rights of national minorities at this moment. And the Supreme Court has already aided such, uh, such efforts by invalidating key sections of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. The kind of economic, the kind of extreme economic inequality that Stevens came to deplore has in our own time come under intense public scrutiny. But powerful politicians and equally powerful media outlets nonetheless work hard to denounce, to restrict, and dismantle even our threadbare social safety net and blame poverty upon the poor. The wanton and unpunished killing of unarmed black people 
by police and white supremacist vigilantes brings to mind the terror that white supremacists imposed to kill Reconstruction and against which Thaddeus Stevens fought. Maybe by reacquainting ourselves with the things that someone like Thaddeus Stevens stood for and worked so hard to achieve in his time, we can gain inspiration and borrow courage and win confidence in fighting for at least some of the things that need to be done in our own time. Thank you for your attention. I hope you will ask me questions about this subject. Thank you, Bruce. What a fascinating discussion. And I agree, it is a great time to remember Thaddeus Stevens. Without further ado, let's jump into some Q&A. If you haven't had a chance to ask your question, you still can drop it into the Q&A feature. There's a link at the bottom of your screen. And let's get started. Ed asks, how close or distant were Stephen's relations with Lincoln? An interesting question, Steve. Um, Stephen saw Lincoln a lot. They had some correspondence during the process of building the Republican Party. They cooperated with one another. Um, as I said, uh, Stevens was very critical of Lincoln throughout the war for being in Stevens' eyes too slow. But whenever Lincoln took a step forward, Stevens cheered it. As he put it, what can our approach be in this situation? And he answered his own question. He said, to criticize privately, but cheer publicly, because he very clearly understood that whatever he thought of Lincoln, the alternative was much worse. The Democratic Party of its day that was effectively pro-slavery. Lincoln considered Stevens an ally, but also a terrible nuisance. After all, Stevens was always prodding him, almost literally poking him in the back uh, and calling upon him to do more. But Stevens also said of people, but beg your pardon, Lincoln also said of people like Stevens that while they are an annoyance, their faces are, are directed in the right direction. They face God as we do. They face Zion. And so these two men were pursuing the same fundamental goals as often as not, but moving at different rates of speed. Okay. Thank you for that. Nick asks, you mentioned in the book that by neither placating the North or South fully, the Compromise of 1850 set the stage for the tension and conflict over the course of the next decade that ultimately set the stage for the Civil War. Do you think that a more decisive resolution in favor of either the North or South in 1850 would have had any result other than starting the Civil War 10 years earlier? And that's a hard question because of course it's a counterfactual question. We need to wonder what would have happened had history gone down a different path. Um, I think that had the concessions contained in the Compromise of 1850 not been made, uh, there would have been even louder voices than there were at the time calling for disunion. Whether that would have actually gain the kind of Southern support that it would 10 years later, it's hard to gauge. Um, if uh, war, if secession had occurred, my guess is that it would have been a, a, a less powerful movement at the time and conceivably could have been suppressed more easily. But had it been suppressed more easily, slavery would not have been abolished as rapidly as it was 
later on and without compensation. It actually took a powerful pro-slavery war effort to compel the Union to abolish slavery in the short order that it did. So uh, in one sense, the slave owners dug their own grave and did the abolitionists a favor by seeking to break up the Union when they did. Uh, had it been an easier job, had putting down secession been easier as it might have been in 1850, well, the same dynamic could not have played out. All right, moving right along, William asks or says, thank you for this biography of Thaddeus Stevens. Can you comment on the story that the young lawyer Stevens' beliefs on slavery were informed by his first or early client he had in Gettysburg, wherein he represented the slave owner who won the case for return of the slave to the slave owner. And then he adds, and his disgust with the result he helped obtain forever made him an abolitionist. Um, William, you're not alone in um, suggesting that um, possibility. And I certainly looked for evidence that the Charity Butler case, which is I think the one you're referring to, um, made him decide um, more firmly to oppose slavery than he had done previously. I don't rule it out, but I found no evidence for it. Um, I think Stevens, like uh, quite a few people in the North who opposed slavery, did not for a long time make themselves make all aspects of their life conform to or reflect that opposition of slavery. And so it was that even long before Stevens um, was clearly opposed to slavery, in his legal practice, he would defend both fugitives and those chasing fugitives. It's not until the middle of the 1830s when the North-South conflict over slavery begins to escalate that it becomes clear to Stevens that this is the central question and that all other things do revolve around it and that he needs to make his stance more consistent on it. And so he does indeed bring the rest of his life or at least begin to bring the rest of his life into closer consonance with his opposition to slavery. Okay, Ed asks, did Stevens think that Confederate leaders like Davis and Lee should have been tried for treason? I haven't seen, or at least I don't recall seeing anything by Stevens saying that in so many words. Well, it's entirely possible that he did. Stevens, however, was in general in favor of treating the Confederate leadership very sternly. <coughs> Considered them traitors consider them responsible for the uh, tremendous bloodletting that secession and the attempt to suppress secession uh, in uh, defense of the union had caused. And uh, he distinguished between the leaders on the one hand for whom he had no sympathy and the rank and file of the Confederacy, the great mass of whites in the South who he believed had been tricked and misled into secession and war. And so he did not seek to punish them. Whether or not he specifically wanted to see the harshest treatment dealt out to people like Lee and Davis, I, I, I simply don't recall. I don't believe I, uh, I ran across evidence to that effect. Okay. Nick asks, you discuss Stevens' view of equality frequently in the book, highlighting his belief that inequality born of fair competition is justified. Would you argue that he placed a higher value on freedom than equality, despite the popular reputation of being an egalitarian? Well, it depends. When we say egalitarian, it depends on uh, what it is we're discussing, equal in what respect. I think he was an egalitarian in the, in the sense that he wished all to have an equal rights before the law um, and eventually to have equal rights 
to participate in political life. That is a kind of egalitarian. He was not uh, someone who believed that all should have equal wealth, much less was he a socialist and believed that all property, all productive property should belong to the people in common. But he did come to believe, as I said earlier, that in order for people to really achieve freedom, it was necessary to do away with extreme forms of economic inequality because extreme forms of economic inequality, he believed, made freedom impossible. Okay, Chuck has a comment here. This was an excellent lecture about an introduction for me to the life of Thaddeus Stevens. I plan to buy and read the book. And of course, a gentle reminder that you can buy the book using the link in the chat feature. And Bruce asks, uh, as you noted, there are so many dismaying parallels between that time and our own, politically, culturally, socially. But I wonder, would a Thaddeus Stevens have any success or even prominence in a 21st century Congress? Well, Bruce, that's, that's another tough one. Um, if let's say a Thaddeus Stevens, let's say a revolutionary, since I'm arguing that that's what he was in his time. So would someone with revolutionary attitudes today uh, have success in modern America? And I think the answer right now is no. Um, because as I think is clear from the life of Stevens as well as Lincoln and virtually anybody else I can think of, circumstances make the great person. They, the qualities may be in that individual all along, but only certain circumstances will allow those qualities to achieve success and turn that person into a successful political leader. They did not exist in the 1830s. They didn't exist in the 1840s. They did exist under the pressure of war and revolution. We aren't in that situation today and so I think Stevens would be someone uh, standing in a small minority trying to make his opinions more popular and hoping that circumstances would change. Okay, David says, according to some views, Lincoln's reticence early in the war on the centrality of slavery was guided by his desire to hold the so-called border states in the Union. Did Stevens events concern about retention of the border states or did his desire to end slavery overrule such concerns? There's a good, it's, an, it's a very interesting question because yes, it's true. I think it's clearly true that um, Lincoln was very concerned with holding the so-called uh, loyal slave states, the border states that remain within the Union with keeping them in the Union, particularly Kentucky, which he thought was the key to victory in the war. And to that end, Lincoln placated uh, those slave owners in those states and bent toward the rep political representatives of those states who remained in the House and the Senate. By the summer of 1862, Lincoln had lost patience with the advice he was being given, the conservative advice. And he said in so many words, more than once, that listening to that advice, trying to placate this sector of the population was the biggest mistake I made, or at least it was the biggest thing preventing me from doing what needed to be done. And, there, and Thaddeus Stevens was critical from the beginning of Stevens listening to that border state advice and bending to that border state pressure. Stevens believed that the key to victory was not appeasing the border states, but making the struggle against all the slaveholders more powerful and more vigorous. Okay, 
Okay, a quick comment here. Thank you for this program. This is from Alex Paul Loza. I'm currently sculpting a life-size monument of Stevens commissioned by the Thaddeus Stevens Society. Unveiling is schedule, scheduled for April 4th, 2022 in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Hope you can join us. And he's at alexpauloza.com. I hope so too. Uh, how did Stevens, this is from Andy, how did Stevens' views and role regarding slavery and reconstruction compare with that of Char Senator Charles Sumner? Did they work together? Were they rivals? They did work together. These two individuals' uh, views were far closer than were either of their views close to Lincoln's. Um, Sumner was the chief figure, for example, who in the Senate was also calling for breaking up the planters' uh, uh, estates and dividing them. And Sumner had as little success as Stevens did in the House. All along the line, Sumner and Stevens were usually arguing for the same things. They may have disagreed tactically once or twice uh, about how to address a given legislative problem, but they were on the same page um, uh, almost always. From Ross, how crucial was Stevens to the outcome of the Civil War and Reconstruction? If he had died in 1860, would somebody else have been able to do what he did? Well, oh, you're asking me tough questions tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he was very important to the victory because the measures that he was pressing for were very important to the victory. Lincoln himself says at the end that without uh, these nearly 200,000 uh, black men who served either in the Union Army or the uh, Union Navy, uh, victory would not have been possible. Um, whether somebody else could have pressed that point uh, uh, had Stevens died earlier, it's very difficult to say. Sumner, for example, and he, uh, to refer to a previous question, would have pushed that uh, uh, idea and so would Giddings and a number of other radical Republicans and the circumstances, the, re the inner logic of events that Frederick Douglass referred to would have also uh, pressed the point uh, in, uh, in effect upon Lincoln. So I'm not saying that the war could not have been won without Thaddeus Stevens, but I do think that he played an important role in making victory possible. Rich, is it fair to say that Stevens' views of union labor rights and female suffrage were near identical to Benjamin Wade's? Did Stevens' employment practices as an owner of an ironworks, as an owner of an ironworks, comport to notions of labor rights? Stevens, it depends on what you think of as labor rights, right? Um, Stevens was apparently popular with his employees at the, uh, at the Iron Works. Um, when Jubla Early, uh, uh, when word reaches the Iron Works that Jubal Early is headed there, Stevens employees act actively move to get Stevens out of there because they anticipate what would happen if Stevens were still there when Jubal Early arrived. But Stevens said and did very little on the subject of the rights of free laborers in the North. I read a number of authors who said that he did, but when I uh, checked the sources that they cited, I couldn't find the evidence uh, on which they had based their claims. So I uh, cannot say uh, what his views were about the rights and wrongs of labor um, in the free states at the time of his maturity and at the time of his death. Ronald asks, what do you think of the portrayal of Stevens by Tommy Lee Jones in the Steven Spielberg movie, Lincoln? Did Jones capture the essence of Stevens? Well, I think Tommy Lee Jones turned in a hell of a performance. Um, I really enjoyed it. Although I did find it a little odd to see um, a Texas accent coming out of the mouth of a man supposedly born in Vermont. Nonetheless, 
it, it's, it's a fine performance. Whether it captures Stevens is another matter. And I think that really is a matter of, uh, uh, did the writers capture Stevens? And, I, and my answer to that is no, they did not. Because I think that film portrays Stevens as being as much of a problem for the abolition of slavery as part of the solution. Uh, you'd never know from the movie, for example, that Thaddeus Stevens was calling for an amendment to abolish slavery a year before Lincoln agreed to do so. Agreed to support that idea. And the movie makes it look like Stevens is <coughs> too extreme, too egalitarian racially, um, and that his uh, his uh, radical views will doom the success of the 13th Amendment. And so it seems as you watch the movie that Stevens has to be talked into toning down his views on the floor of the House in order to get that amendment passed. And they show him, you recall, uh, being uh, facing a Democratic uh, congressman, <coughs> excuse me, who uh, says, give up your ideas of uh, racial equality. And Stephen says, I'm not talking about equality in all things. I'm talking about equality before the law. And then of course, uh, his opponent says, well then give that up too. And, Link and Stephen says, I, I refuse. Well, calling for equality before the law is made to seem like a small thing, less than Stephen's believed in calling for equality before the law was a very big thing. Not everyone who supported the abolition of slavery supported equality before the law for those freed. And Stevens did so from the start. So I think that's a problem with the movie. Okay, I wanna draw your attention to the time. We, we've got about three minutes, so maybe we can get to a couple more. Was there anything in researching this book that surprised you or challenged your prior interpretations of Stephen? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Um, I expected to find when I began studying Stevens that there'd be a straight line from the radicalism of his Vermont youth to the radicalism of his mature years and the radical egalitarianism of his mature years. So I was startled to discover that as a younger man, he had indeed been heavily influenced by, uh, among other things, the things he read in college. And he was extremely hostile to those who um, were calling for greater economic equality in the North. He was also hostile to revolutions in general. And, um, said disparaging things about the French Revolution and other revolutions of the time. <coughs> Excuse me. He was also not an advocate. Um, at the time, he was a delegate to the uh, Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention in the 1830s of genuinely universal male suffrage. He did not believe that the very poorest white men should have the right to vote. Um, and that reflected an ancient small r Republican belief that those without property cannot act independently as independent thinking citizens. And therefore Stevens doubted that they should be given the right to vote. I was surprised by that too. And that was another idea that Stevens was going to have to discard later in life. So Stephen's life was much, contained many more zigzags than I anticipated. Wow, what a great, what a great talk. I'm so sorry that we're unable to get to the rest of the questions because the audience is, is really enjoying um, your discussion. And again, I apologize that we did not get to a handful of questions. We could clearly go for another hour. Um, but our time has come to a close. I want to thank you, Bruce Levine, uh, for joining us this evening. And, and thank you all for coming and your wonderful questions. Your patronage is what enables us to bring you programming like this. And we cannot continue to host events like this without the book sales to support them. So please support Bruce and Politics and Prose.
by using the link in the chat to purchase Thaddeus Stevens, Civil War Revolutionary, Fighter for Racial Justice. Please visit our website for the most up-to-date event listings. We do hope to see you again soon, and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you again, Bruce, and stay well-read, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Chelsea, and thank you, everyone. Thank you.